This is the In Focus podcast from the Hindu. Hello and welcome to the Hindu's In Focus podcast. As the dust settles on the proposals that the finance minister made in the budget earlier this month, some aspects have become clearer while questions remain on others. Today we have with us Professor Lekha Chakraborty to help simplify aspects of budget 2024-25. She is a professor at the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy and also a governing board member of the International Institute of Public Finance in Munich. Today we will dwell on topics such as why the minister chose to be less aggressive on the fiscal deficit front than she could have, why Andhra Pradesh and Bihar were given special consideration when such action was actually within the purview of the finance commission and what the changeover from cooperative federalism to competitive federalism means for the states uh, thank you so much professor lekha chakraborty for joining us today um, considering we are just really truly fresh um, off the budget speech your perspectives and opinions will be valuable to us really appreciate your being with us here today thank you for having me so Before we get down to the specifics if you have to give us a a view of the budget in two or three sentences how would you rate it how would you word it uh, what did it make you feel as soon as the budget speech got over and saying yeah this is where we are going oh yes uh, you know this budget is about the narrative of prime minister about you know the high income country india is going to be a high income country by 2047 so that vikasit bharat was the narrative and this budget is used as a tool to achieve that and uh, you know to me the announcements were not populist at all uh, uh, finance minister was very considerate about uh, you know fiscal consolidation at the same time uh, she was focusing on employment policies great so we saw your piece uh, in the hindu business line immediately the day after and you say that the fm the finance minister has kept fiscal policy accommodative given that the rbi is you know really keeping interest rates higher than expected control inflation so obviously it takes two to tango and i get what you're saying but just help us reconcile the following facts because obviously there are some dots to be connected and your view will help us so the rbi dividend has likely been used to maintain fiscal discipline and that obviously is very valuable to the government deficit is obviously targeted lower than estimated earlier during the interim budget at the same time public uh, capital expenditure is said to be flat and actually there are some expectations in some quarters that even compared to the interim budget public capex would go up uh, because private capex has not sort of you know roared in as one would have wanted it to and uh, obviously there's been a lot said for the common man or the woman saying there is no more cash in the hands of the common man or woman as compared to earlier So in an interview the FM herself said that um, you know you can't do much with income tax beyond a point you know given her constraints so how would you help us connect these dots sure you know there are two components to your question the first is about the macro economic framework itself and you said it that central bank is focusing on price stability by keeping the interest rates higher and what is its impact on the budget you know as the uh central bank is keeping the interest rates higher uh, you know the public debt management is going very costly so in the low interest rate regime uh, it's okay to have high fiscal deficit or high debt because we can do capex formation using that high debt and high fiscal deficit but now it's no longer a low interest rate regime and that's you know affecting the public debt management and also you know it is affecting the growth recovery process in the sense growth recovery requires interest rate to be lower but we can't do much about it rbi cannot do anything about it because you know it has to do the interest rate defense to keep up with the you know global interest rates and uh, we have to keep the interest rate not in the negative uh, you know quadrant so these are the concerns and of course the financialization of savings so rbi can't do a sudden uh, you know uh, 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 you know uh, they, they cannot do a sudden cut in the interest rate so interest rate management is now going entirely for the inflation containment rbi is focusing on that now 
Finance minister needs to be fiscally accommodative, otherwise growth recovery process will suffer. And she knew about it. And that's why, you know, she kept her interest rate. Uh, she kept her fiscal deficit uh, high, e higher than the anticipated 4.5 or even down the 3%. That, that's going to be a fiscal waterboarding if she, uh, you know, maintains the uh, fiscal deficit at 3% from next year onwards. She cannot do that and she will not do that. Her path is to achieve 4.5 by next year, 24, 20, 25, 26. So towards that path, she kept or she pegged her interest uh, she pegged i'm always talking about interest rate and finance minister it's a slip of the tongue she uh, talked about her fiscal deficit at uh, you know 4.5 in this budget so that's the way it is so this is the macroeconomic framework now your question regarding the policies to stimulate the aggregate demand because there is no cash in the hands of people we had two options. One was going through the path of UBI, Universal Basic Income, which we have spoken about it in the economic survey a few years back. But, you know, Finance Minister has not taken a step regarding the Universal Basic Income. Rather than that, she focused on, uh, you know, targeted cash transfers. Along with that, uh, she, uh, you know, helped the people to get more disposable income by reducing, uh, you know, uh, the, or, or by adjusting the tax rates. It's not by reducing the tax rate, but, you know, her in the new tax regime, if Indians go towards, she's nudging Indians to go towards a new tax regime where she simplified the deductions, you know, it, she increased from, uh, she increased the standard deduction from 50 thousand to seventy five thousand and the slaps the tax slap she slightly readjusted so that the benefits of this tax policy decisions uh, will be there for the lower middle class you know it's not the upper income uh, you know she has not done anything regarding the uh, tax uh, for the upper middle class but the disposable income in the hands of the people will be higher as there is slight adjustment but she's nudging us to go towards a new tax regime. And she also promised that simplification of the tax uh, you know, regime uh, in, uh, in terms of the corporate tax helped her and around 50% of her revenue came from that simplification and the new tax regime in the corporate tax. So that was, that was the empirical evidence she provided that in case of uh, you know, personal income tax also towards new regime, she can have little more collections and it will also help, uh, you know, Indians to have more disposable income in the hands, but not through the cash transfers. Rather, she focused on participation income. Participation income means the people, uh, you know, they can participate in the Indian economy through more employment uh, generation opportunities. And that's the way she pitched her budget. But we need to see the new centrally sponsored scheme. She's talking about the skilling and the employment. You know, employer of last resort, that's, that's a welcome policy. Okay. So you did uh, touch upon employment and skilling, and I do have a question. I'll come to that later. But uh, again, in your piece, you also refer to the budget for the first time, having addressed the public finance and expenditure needs of the states. Um, and you also talk about the competitive federalism framework. If the heavy lifting has to be done by the states within this framework, could you help you know us, the common people, understand uh, with a couple of examples of what the states could or should do now that they did not have the bandwidth of financial support to do so earlier? This is a very sensitive question. Uh, it relates to the political economy of the union budget, uh, you know, this year. And the political economy, that compelling political economy, you know it, that, you know, it's a coalition government. Uh, so there were a lot of announcements, a preferential treatment for Bihar and Andhra Pradesh in the budget. So, you know, uh, constitutionally, if we can think about how the center government and the state governments can do through the cooperative federalism. That's what exactly was happening all, all these years, that cooperative federalism was given importance through intergovernmental fiscal transfers. Now, this budget is a shift from cooperative federalism to competitive federalism. And uh, the competitive federalism is, 
you know, you need to have data on benchmarking. You benchmark a best jurisdiction or a be best state and the other states need to emulate or try to reach to that point. So this is closely correlated to benchmarking. So how do you do a benchmarking in the context of an emerging economy like India? One. Second, uh, you know, I would have been comfortable had Finance uh, Commission been talking about, uh, you know, the intergovernmental fiscal transfers. But the announcements in the budget towards the states were highly arbitrary and ad hoc. And, you know, it uh, preferred a few states. It missed a few states. And, of course, Finance Minister has pointed out that she cannot talk about all the states in the budget. Then, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a matter of concern. Uh, because the political economy relates to the states asking for special category status. And that's a matter of concern. How many states can we entertain when they ask for the special category states? It will not stop with Bihar or Andhra Pradesh. Most states will come forward based on their constrained fiscal space and the exposure to natural calamities. And Orissa has they have already, uh, you know, come forward with such demands. And most states are likely to come forward. So constitutionally, if we address these concerns, that's better. But ad hoc and arbitrary decisions in the budget regarding the states will affect. So to me, uh, what could what could be ideal if you ask? To me, the 16th Finance Commission can take a stand about increasing the magnitude of devolution to the states. Now it is 41%. So don't think about declining it further to 40 or 31 because that's going to be a fiscal waterboarding for the states. Because right now the states are operating with very limited fiscal space. And so an increase in the divisible pool, uh, you know, from 41 to even 50 based on the consideration that the shrinking of, you know, the pool is real with sets and surcharge, with the design of the sets and surcharge. So this requires more deliberations. It is uh, completely outside the purview of union budget. But for the first time ever, a center government is urging or asking the states to do heavy lifting in terms of total factor productivity. All the policies related to the land, labor, capital and investment Center government is nudging the states to take it up. And of course, we continued with the policy of capex transfers to the states to do the capex or the capital or the infrastructure process. So this is an era in which macroeconomic uncertainties are faced both by center and the states due to poly crisis. But this uh, macroeconomic stabilization function is a function of the center government. But we can't say that it's no longer confined to the center government, given the fact that states are equally exposed to the macroeconomic uncertainties. So I'm concerned about this. So wonderful point that you make, Professor. So, you know, in a very simplified uh, kind of view, if so, if the, you're saying, you know, let the Finance Commission play a sort of objective role and where they, the Commission feels that a particular state needs more, the devolution could be higher uh, significantly or otherwise, but that this should not have been done in the budget point well taken. So from a, if I have to take a very simplified view, if such a large quantum had not been allocated for AP or Bihar, considering the political uh, compulsions that the government is faced with, so obviously that, you know, money could have been spent better elsewhere. Is that as simple a view as that? Or are there certain complicated calculations that come into play there saying, no, it's not as simple. Just because you give away X rupees for a certain um, a state, it doesn't mean I spend X rupees less. How do you see this? Because obviously there are demands from all other sections of the society, including the common man and woman. But, you know, the, the finance minister is saying there's only so much I could do. So if she had not done so much or allocated so much for the coming year for these two states, other aspects could have been sort of taken care of better? Uh, of course, you know, uh, you know, of course, the revenue stability is very important for the expenditure design. And, uh, you know, revenue stability, little bit, uh, we are comfortable because we got the dividends. Uh, of course, disinvestment is another story. So, you know, with that limited uh, revenue receipts, of course, tax are buoyant. You said that uh, a portion of that 
revenue receipts is now focused on uh, you know bihar and andhra pradesh and of course the coalition politics that affects the budget uh, design and that's real you know the coalition politics that affected the design that political economy of budget uh, is very crucial but where i am coming from of course you mentioned about the trade off within the budget uh, you know the allocation would have been greater for the other designs related to the employment generation and growth recovery process that is true but where i am coming from i am coming from you know another perspective that we can't have a preferential statement for the states um you know that is constitutionally uh, there is a design there is an intergovernmental fiscal transfers based on a scientific formula we need to have a rethinking about the criteria on efficiency and equity in which we transfer intergovernmental fiscal transfers to the states and the announcements were highly ad hoc and arbitrary in nature uh, you know that that's where i am concerned of course that coalition politics is affecting the government but you know uh, i thought government could have handled uh, this outside the purview of the budget rather than having a preferential announcements to the states fearing that there will be a strong pressurized politics for coalition uh, not coalition for special category status uh, so that that's a, a point where i was coming from okay so uh, considering it should have been kept outside the purview of the budget and preferably within that of the finance commission does the finance commission have a right to roll this back saying no it's actually comes under our purview and we'll decide what to do so don't do this can that happen because we've heard stories of earlier governments trying to influence the finance commission in some way or the other and uh, the chief of the commission at that time refused saying no this is you know i'm an independent authority so you let me work so we've heard such anecdotes um so does the finance commission now have the legal authority to sort of take this over and say no this cannot be done uh no that negotiation may not happen because a roll back of a budget policy that a finance minister can do for example uh, you know stock markets are volatile there was a random walk even led uh, you know fluctuations of volatility in the market from the capital gains so she can have a roll back on the capital gains tax policy you know very soon like that finance minister cannot do a roll back in terms of what she has announced or promised in terms of physical infrastructure for the states or the support for the states that's not possible so what uh, the new reality or the new normal uh, in front of you know the 16th finance commission is an articulation towards more unconditional transfers based on a scientific formula in which the states can be uh, treated uh, from the perspective of efficiency and equity criteria but right now as the narrative has gone from cooperative federalism the tool in which cooperative federalism work predominantly is the fiscal transfers now it is towards competitive federalism and i read a breton uh, you know breton talks about this competitive federalism in the context of canada but that's based on and uh, you know benchmarking uh, so which state we are going to benchmark and the other states can aspire to be there and here you know uh, it, it's a very complicated process uh, this competitive federalism and we need to have more deliberations regarding the competitive federalism but uh, i don't think finance commission uh, will uh, ask or will get into the programs already announced uh, that's done and dusted and but in future a scientific formula based intergovernmental fiscal transfers to the states can be more uh, based on equity and efficiency so that no states uh, fear that uh, they, we will be left alone you know based on the differentials in the party in par you know these are all studied empirically by harvard economist uh, alberto alicina but that time i read these as my academic interest that uh, there will be uh, you know preferential treatment if the parties in par or the ethno fragmentation these are factors but it's now getting real and it's a matter of concern if we do this ad hoc and arbitrary rather than through a constitutionally mandated finance commission that's that's a matter of concern wonderful 
So you did mention the proposals on skilling and employment. When it comes to um, you know pa reimbursement, partial reimbursement of EPA for contributions for new employees uh, for manufacturing companies, um, that's one example of a proposal. But if you look at this holistically, and I come with a slightly biased view, um, I would imagine that this would have been a 20-year process where you start at the grassroots level because we've had so many reports year after year where fifth standard kids were not able to answer second standard uh, English or math questions, you know, and so on and so forth, where the quality of education, high absenteeism among teachers, um, and, you know, some schools just having one teacher uh, across several uh, grades, standards. So it's quite a messy, in my opinion, of course, it's quite a messy situation as far as education goes, school and upwards. To be able to fix this um, maybe requires a lot more money than India has. I don't know. But um, this is, it seems like a response to demands from society saying, do something. So we've done something. Uh, do you think this is a good first step? And of course, more to be done. Or like, are they starting at the wrong, wrong end of the spectrum? Oh, you mentioned about the quality and the quantity aspects related to education. So when we design the social infrastructure policies for education, for employment, you know, you name it, uh, you know, we can't, uh, you're right, like the you know, states are at the different stages of development in terms of social infrastructure. Some states, you know, can focus on the quality related aspects in education. Like, you know, it's not just quantity that you increase the enrollment ratio and, uh, you know, uh, that, that that's it. No, uh, the quality related issues, we call it as second generation reforms in the social infrastructure, especially education. Uh, so you're right. Uh, but uh, our program is designed in a sense that at least the first generation reforms be uh, completed, like in terms of quantity, let the children be in school. So what can we do about that to increase the enrollment ratio, to decrease the dropouts? Then comes the question of the second generation reforms related to you know, the quality related aspects you mentioned. And that's exactly what a certain uh, South Indian, a few South Indian states focused on, uh, you know, when they talk about the centrally sponsored scheme, as by design, as we are focusing on the quantity, the first generation reforms in the social infrastructure, including education, some states are not even able to you know, spend that money because they are into the second generation reforms. So this is a matter of concern. But uh, to me, uh, you know, the announcement by the government to get the data fixed, you know, that data at regular intervals on employment, which is an important variable when it comes to the Indian context. So far, we had periodic uh, labor force survey and CMIs, high frequency data on employment employment and employment. But now the government is thinking very serious about this important macroeconomic variable that is employment. So I focus on this data building process related to the employment, which is very crucial. Then only, you know, uh, these policies which are announced will reach the intended beneficiaries. We need to get the data on board because dashboard uh, related to the firms, you know, that data get replaced after a point of time. So moving, uh, you know, that shift from uh, the National Statistical uh, Organization's, uh, you know, data towards dashboard is a matter of concern because dashboard doesn't provide a time series data or the data we can protect at the regular intervals because it replaces. So the data building is very crucial for the meaning, meaningful policies related to employment and social infrastructure. Okay, so from a database building perspective, you seem to say it's a good first step, but of course there are reforms to be done both at the state and central level. Um, so the direct benefit transfers, and this is our final question, the direct benefit transfers that the government seems to have promised and the industry is saying, yeah, it's good, but please tell us how you'll do it. Um, now that we've done this DBTs for households and farmers and so on, it probably is a done deal. And that's what the, you know, the observe, an observer like me who's not like sort of really clued into the government. That's what we would think. Um, but looking at the skepticism that is sort of, you know, in, the, in, in reading in between the lines when industry says this, 
do you think there's going to be a mammoth effort in terms of getting it to the young people and you know also preventing fraud because you, you could have multiple people uh, registering themselves multiple times and so on and so forth how do you see this um, the intent is good but implementation is going to be messy uh, or has any other country done this because uh, paying for employment other countries have done this i myself have experienced offers from singapore for instance small startups we didn't even know that we would be on their uh, horizon but they sent they actually sent us a letter saying if you set up an office in singapore for every employee you have we will have an additional employee at our cost for you so that's of course it's a city state can afford to do it and so on but um, this particular uh, direct benefit transfer is it an easy thing to accomplish oh uh, it, it's very important question and the prelude is public digital infrastructure uh, so are we ready that's a question related to the public digital infrastructure if that is not ready uh, then you know we are not going to get intended result as you rightly pointed out there could be ghost beneficiaries and that's going to be a matter of concern and leakages in the fiscal policy so uh, this uh, uh, digital infrastructure is very crucial to prevent ghost beneficiaries that's a very important point it's sorry. very well taken yeah i'm yeah. sorry to interrupt uh, but like i mentioned if you've done this for members of a family based on a ration card or uh, farmers uh, with the aid of an other identity it shouldn't be that much more difficult for youngsters especially if you are they are affiliated through educational institutions so i know the implementation details are still um, not in the public domain but why do you think uh, this public infrastructure may not be ready for us yet i thought it was at least it had matured to a certain stage if not the whole hog of course i understand your uh, confidence and positivity related to the digital infrastructure because uh, if you globally if you check uh, you know the other countries you asked only kenya and india are the two countries uh, you know gone forward with this dbt the uh, direct benefit transfers and uh, the digital infrastructure getting ready but i have uh, my own concerns related to this because digital divide is huge and in times of covid we have seen that how much it affected the educational outcomes so i was little concerned about that digital divide of course if there is no digital divide we can uh, you know take this policy forward by focusing on you know the dbt um, but it it is going to be a one time transfer it cannot be a continuous uh, policy so that's what you are coming to that uh, as we have announced right now is it is it going to be continuous do we have a fiscal space for that i don't think we have a fiscal space for this but it's it, it's it's a kind of a you know the transition uh, towards focusing on uh, you know employment and uh, you know the concerns related to the uh you know emerging economies employment and employability uh, so i don't think that we have the fiscal space uh, to go ahead with this policies at different point of time or longitudinally it's wonderful we've come to the end of our conversation uh, professor thank you so much uh, wonderful insights that we've been able to glean from you in the past half an hour truly really appreciate it uh, look forward to my pleasure uh, yeah. to thank, thank you, you so much yeah thank you In Focus will be back soon with analysis of the biggest news issues. In the meantime, you can find our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher and other platforms. Just search for In Focus by The Hindu. We'll see you soon.